just turned my camera on, so don't do anything gross or say anything rude. Hello. Sorry, you are listening to the sound of my really camera shy husband making toast and me rummaging through our recycling at the same time. It's making me, it's making me really nervous because he doesn't want to be on camera. Okay, he's gone now. <laughs> it's so weird. The world's never crossed. Like, there's never anyone in the room with me when I'm doing this. So it's always like it's just me and you when it's me and you, and then it's someone else as well, in real life, it makes it very weird, I don't like it. He's gone upstairs to carry on working on Dirt Science magazine. That's his job, that's what he's good at. <clears throat> right, and I've got my paints, I have found some fresh recycling. And I've got story time, all right. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention something in the Facebook version of this show this morning. So I mustn't forget to mention it today. It's so good. So many weird stuff about snails. All right, should we get started? What do you think? Got my little shells. Yeah. Got my leg. Everything's fine. I'm suspicious because it's not, it's not really that late, is it? Oh, it is quite late, actually. Oh, no, I'll take it back. It's five past. The perfect time to get started. Okay. Right. Uh, yeah. I'm just going to flip you. I'm going to do it. <clears throat> Oh, the people just joining. Brilliant. Welcome. We're just about to get started. Hello, Science Alliance. 
I am Lara, you are the Science Alliance. This is not the All Ages Home Ed lesson where there are printouts and you have to learn things and answer questions. No, this is the informal chat that I do every week with a Lego story time at the end about a thing that I've been learning about. And this week I've been learning about snails. I've got the most snail-like jumper on that I can find. I've got my snail hair in. We're going to talk about snails. What are snails? Snails are... <clears throat> So quite a few times recently in shows, we've been looking at how scientists split the animal king, well, split the, the natural world into different kingdoms. So there's an animal kingdom, plant kingdom, fungus kingdom, etc, etc. Um, snails are obviously in the animal kingdom. We always end up saying the animal kingdom is split into different phylum. And this thing we're studying today is in the chordata phylum, which means the animals that have backbones. Snails obviously do not have backbones. Snails are mollusks. So snails are in the same kind of group as like octopuses uh, and ammonites and nautiluses and that sort of thing. Um, so let's talk about their shells first of all. You think about snails, you think about shells. We'll do the most obvious ones first and then we'll go down to the less obvious things. So uh, we can do an activity actually straight away to explore in quite a basic way the the maths behind a snail's shell. So I said to bring some plastic from your recycling. You want some kind of sturdy plastic. If it's see-through, that's good. Doesn't really matter if it's not see-through. What we're gonna do is get a little blob of paint, put it onto one of the bits of plastic, and then with the other bit of plastic, press down so it all smudges out, and then lift it off without smearing it at all. Just a press, really good squeeze, and a lift without smearing, and see what happens. I said to bring some scissors because obviously uh, the plastic needs to be flat. Don't be just cutting up stiff bits of plastic from your recycling without an adult around. It's a very dangerous thing to do. You can really cut yourself like a paper cup, but worse because plastic. I'm going at it here to try and be fast. Very, da very dangerous and reckless thing I'm doing in front of you right now. Okay, right, I did it. <laughs> so, um, what, we're, what we're going to see here, I'll just do it for you. Oh, do you know what? On Facebook, I only used one colour paint. I'm going to use two colours of paint. So I'm literally just putting a tiny blob. You don't want any more than like a one pea sized blob if you're in the UK. So I've, I've gone two colours. Yeah, it's not a teacher. <laughs> I'm just going to press my blob of paint with another bit of plastic. That's right, so really spread it out. It would, it would be more interesting if it was seafood, wouldn't it? Never mind. Spread, 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 push, 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 and then take it off without smearing and what, see what pattern you get. Ah, oh, so lovely. No offence, Facebook, this is so much better than the one I did on Facebook this morning. You get this beautiful, but actually really quite special mathematical pattern. The pattern that you are looking at, if you've done this activity, is a fractal pattern. Fractal patterns, oh, I'll put that somewhere, are, they're like patterns where... Um, a small bit of it is the same as a big bit of it. The, the best way is just to show you. So like a fern leaf is a good example of a fractal pattern. So the, the whole leaf, this one's looking a little bit sad now, but the, the, the whole overall leaf is made out of fronds. But if you look at each frond, oops, that's just my face, sorry. The whole leaf has a certain shape, but if you look at each frond, it's got the same sort of shape, yeah, as the whole leaf. And if you look at an individual frond, not a biologist. Look, it's even that is made up of other tiny little kind of fronds coming off it that are the same. So you've got one little bit making up another bit, making up another bit, but it's kind of all the same. <laughs> so that's what you've got. We've done, actually done a whole show with a Lego story time just about fractal patterns. So I won't go too much into the science of how this happens because you can look it up on YouTube if you like. So do with kind of differences in air pressure and squeezing. <laughs> um, so a river is a good example of a fractal pattern, but a snail shell is an example of a fractal pattern. Like a, spi a small bit of spiral is the same as a larger bit of spiral. As you scale it up, it's kind of the same thing. To talk really about the maths of a snail shell, we need to talk about Fibonacci numbers. Do you know what they are? She says, like, yeah, I totally knew. I knew what Fibonacci numbers were before I researched this. I've known for ages. They're, they're, I'm not even looking at what they are on a, on a screen. Just remember them. Just work them out. Can you guess what they are? Zero, one, one, two, three, five. This is the Fibonacci sequence. Eight, 13, 21, 
I'm saying I sound like my mum when she has to read her credit card details over the phone. It gets like sort of weirdly formal. 55. 89. That's the Fibonacci sequence. What can you, have you worked out what's happening? Um, what the Fibonacci sequence is, the number, any number, is the sum of the two numbers before it. So like 0 plus 1 equals 1. 2 plus 2 equals 2. Wait. 0 plus 1 equals 1. 1 plus 1 equals 2. 1 plus 2 equals 3. 2 plus 3 equals 5. You see? 3 plus 5 equals 8. Why we're talking about the Fibonacci sequence with snail shells is that if you get squares that are like 1 by 1, 2 by 2, 3 by 3, 5 by 5, 8 by 8, and you put them together and you draw an arc through each square, you get a snail shell. I will show you. I'll show you. Because it's not making any sense to me either, in all honesty. Look, so here's a 1 by 1 square next to a 1 by 1 square next to a 2 by 2 next to a 3 by 3 next to a 5 by 5. This is a Fibonacci sequence. If you draw um, a kind of arc, a curve, from one corner of each square to the other, you get a snail shell, yeah? It's called, something called the golden ratio. We could talk, we could do an entire lesson on this. We're not going to, but snail shells. Beautiful examples of mathematical patterns in nature. Right, let's talk about, <laughs> let's talk about the science of the snail shell now. So, the snail comes out of an egg with its shell, but its shell is very flimsy, it's very see-through. Um, their shells are made of calcium carbonate. So the first thing a snail does, little baby snail when it's born, is it eats its egg shell, basically, because it's made of calcium uh, and it wants the calcium for its shell. Um, so it gets stronger and stronger. If any of its siblings have not hatched out, then it just eats those eggs as well. There's as much calcium as it can get. This is why we think of them as being garden pests, because they're just, they've got a great diet, right? They want to eat like spinach and all the leaves, all the calcium rich foods for their shells. Um, but then the shell kind of gets layers put on it and obviously gets bigger and bigger as they grow. From what I can gather, have you ever seen anyone making candy floss? Like you've got that kind of drum that is spinning and you stick a stick in and the candy floss sticks to the stick. I feel like it's kind of like that. Um, so the, the shell is, the first little baby shell is like the stick and then there's a bit on the body of the snail that secretes the calcium, into the, the calcium carbonate into the shell and it kind of just like gets added on and added on and added on, coils on. Most snails, uh, most snail shells coil to the left, something that I didn't know. Very occasionally they coil to the right. So if you're looking at snails in your garden after this, if you find any that coil to the right, alert the Science Alliance. That would be exciting now. Here's a baby snail shell that I found in my garden. Look like good. Wouldn't be fit of science if we didn't stick something under the hand lens. So let's have a look at this. Uh, there we go. Oh, lovely. So you can see the um, the sort of brown speckles on it are actually soil inside the shell, as far as I can tell. So the actual shell itself is quite translucent. Should I hold it up? Yeah. No, I don't think I'm going to be able to do that. Um, but yeah, it's kind of quite see-through, right? You can see where all the all the layers are built up and up and up. And here's a... I can't fit it on. <laughs> Here's some more, here's some more grown-up ones. So there are 99 species of land snail in the UK. So I've found a few, couple of different ones here. Um, in the world, there's 43,000 species of, of snail. We're only looking at the land snails in this show. My apologies. Um, okay, so that's the shell. Let's, oh, let's look at slime, because this fits in really nicely. So on the front page of this lesson, this show, I showed you some weird things and I said, what are they? They are snail related. What do you reckon these things are? While I'm rib rubbing the Fibonacci sequence off my whiteboard. What are they? Well, snail mucus is amazing stuff. It's a mixture of carbohydrates and proteins and it's made in such a way um, that when there's no, not much pressure on it, then it's a lubricant. You know, like how you add oil to a cog to get it working better. So it, it lubricates the snail so that there's less friction as it slides along. Just makes it easier for the snail to move along, right? Like a skidding on ice. Um, it takes the snail loads of energy to make its slime, its mucus. Like it takes proportionally far more energy for a snail to make slime than it does for a bird to fly in the sky. So making slime is much harder work than like flying or walking. So to save slime, what they do is, 
oh, scientists, oh, just love it. They went to a certain marine snail and they studied the layers of the marine snail trails and they worked out that they were following each other. And they think that most snails do this. So they basically, the first snail kind of lays a little footpath and then the other snail doesn't have to use as much slime because it's already a, not a very frictionful surface. Yeah, nice, isn't it? So, but then if you add pressure to the slime, then it's uh, sticky. So it's a lubricant and it's a glue. So I can climb up things. Ah, amazing. So, right, how are we getting to these weird mystery objects? <sighs> I owe you an apology. We only recently did a show about hibernation and I'm pretty sure during that show, I told you that there were only three animals in Britain that hibernate. I said it was the dormouse and the hedgehog and the bats. Um, that is not true. Those are the only mammals that hibernate. Loads of bugs hibernate, snails hibernate. Um, and when they hibernate, in order to not dry out and to stay protected, they put a layer of mucus over the opening of their shells you know this right if you've ever oh, we shouldn't do it but if you've ever picked up a snail and it's been a bit hard to take it off like maybe you're throwing something away that was in the garage for ages and there's a snail on it so you've got to get rid of it to save the snail there's this like crispy noise right as you peel it off that's you breaking the membrane of um slime that they've that they've covered up the entranceway with yeah so they do that in just warm weather just to stop themselves drying out it's nice eh? now most snails the snails in your garden certainly if you live in the uk will just use quite a thin film of mucus for that of slime uh, which is quite easily broken but some snails the subjects of story time actually they build a proper covering out of calcium carbonate like this the, what they get when they eat leaves and things and this is what one of those is yeah it's called checks notes i should know this actually i should know this it's called an epiphram isn't that incredible you can tell can't you it is the same shape as the as the opening of a snail shell yeah please be be the person on holiday in the mediterranean and someone picks up one of those and goes what is this be the person who says oh yeah it's a snail epiphram um epiphram is spelled e p i P-H-R-A-G-M, and I stared at it for ages like, how do you pronounce that? Ep epiphragm? And then I thought, oh no, I've seen that word before. So put your hand, bear with me, put your hand just under your ribs, okay? If you feel down the front of your ribs, you know you've got that point where the ribs stop sort of in a triangle shape. If you put your hands there like this, it's an old drama activity that you've maybe done before. You put your hands there sort of pointing inwards and you say, ha, ha, ha. Ha, 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 it's good vocal warm up. What you can feel, you can feel like a muscle going in and out and in and out and in and out. Ha, 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 that's your diaphragm, yeah? Your diaphragm, it's that layer of, what is it? Muscle? S stuff, it's that, that layer underneath your, the, the, what's the word I'm looking for? The, oh, it'll come to me. It's, anyway, it's the membrane underneath your lungs that moves up and down and pulls air into your body, right? So yeah, fram, it turns out, is ancient Greek for wall or separation. So you've got a fram, snails have got a fram, but it's an epiphram. I just love it, love it when I plank it together. Look at it, here's an actual epiphram on a snail, which is inside. Isn't that amazing? Massive. Okay, <clears throat> oh, now, now we've got to talk about what this is. Oh, this is weird. So, um, humans, we tend to have males and females, okay? So some of the natural world, you have a male version of the living thing and you have a female version. So the male has the male sex organs that make sperm, female has the female sex organs which make eggs. So when things reproduce, like plants or animals, when anything, well, when a lot of stuff reproduces, all that wants to happen is a sperm gets to an egg and then a new thing starts growing okay so plants tend to use pollen but pollen makes sperm so in a plant it's like the pollen and the egg getting together humans or other animals it's the sperm and the egg um but actually a lot of the natural world is what we call hermaphrodite which means that they have both male and female sex organs in the same animal so snails are hermaphrodite they make sperm and they also make eggs which means that two snails reproducing is apparently an amazing thing to see because they they quite often just reproduce like try and mate out in the open where there are predators and stuff because it just like it, it's 
it takes a lot of concentrating <laughs> to do it because it eggs are quite precious it takes a human body or any kind of body a lot of energy to make an egg sperm not so precious bodies can make absolutely loads of sperm sort of quite easy to make so the snails both of them have the option of getting the sperm to the other one's egg and that's like the preferable thing to do it's just easier like the snails don't care about losing sperm if your egg gets fertilized it's a bit of a faff right you gotta lay the eggs and stuff so so what they do is to help them work out which one gets to put the sperm in they use this thing called a love dart and that's what this is it's basically just an arrow it's a stick it doesn't it doesn't deliver the sperm it's literally just the stick that the snails try and stab each other with you want to see it again yeah here you go this is a ruler it's like nearly a centimeter long this thing it's massive here's a picture of two snails in action look the the love dart what terrible name remember this is a human name as far as the snail's concerned it's not a love dart that love dart is stuck in to this snail so this snail is now going to have its eggs fertilized probably by this snail's sperm um, scientists took ages working out what these love darts were. We think that because they're snails that have them, uh, a lot of them are in the Mediterranean, that maybe even like the myth, the Greek and Roman myths about, or is it Greek? I don't know. The, the thing about Cupid having an arrow and when it stabs people, they fall in love. That might have even come from this snail love dart. It's got something on it that gets injected into the snail and makes it more likely uh, that the eggs will be fertilised by like the, the other one's sperm. Okay. So that's snails and how they mate and love darts. Whew. Right, we need to talk about iron snails. <laughs> we need to talk about um, semi slugs. And I need to show you night versus snail that I didn't show the people on Facebook. And then it'll be uh, time for story time. Okay, so deep down under the ocean, we've just talked about this in Home Edge, there are hydrothermal vents, like hot water coming out of the earth. And they carry various minerals and they carry uh, various iron particles as well. And there are snails live on the bottom of the ocean around these hydrothermal vents that take the iron particles from the hydrothermal vents and basically use them to build armor here are some pictures <laughs> look at these guys so um this is the, the name is the scaly foot gastropod is the name of what these snails are um so yeah they, they just it's just what i said they gather up the iron particles um apparently these sort of bits here these spines are squidgy on the inside but each one of them is just coated with iron yeah for protection it's amazing there's some fool's gold in there as well some some pyrite we don't totally understand it all to be honest they've been fairly newly discovered but yeah aren't they brilliant right quickly come on come on we can get through this nearly story time semi slugs so slugs have evolved from snails quite a few times like there have been snails and then they've changed and evolved and changed and evolved and eventually like evolved into slugs a couple of times because sometimes it's just better to be a slug snails have got shells so they can hide from predators and they can hide in their shells and seal them up with the epiphrams so they don't dry out that's good but snails have got to use a lot of calcium carbonate to make their shells it makes it takes a lot of energy right um and also they can't squeeze into small places to hide whereas slugs can squeeze into small places to hide and then not having to bother to eat loads of calcium to build up a shell. So, depends where you were in the world, like where you evolved, whether it's better to be a slug or a snail. But there's a thing called a semi-slug. I just found out about these. They've made me so happy and so confused. A semi-slug is a real animal that has a shell, but the shell is too small for the creature to get inside the shell. Look at this. <laughs> I don't know what the purpose of a semi-slug is. I, they can't get into small spaces. They're having to use calcium, but they can't hide. They're gonna dry out. I don't know, honestly, I don't know, but I love it. Look, here's another one. Amazing. Semi-slugs are a thing. If you don't remember anything else of what I've just told you today. Brilliant. Right, and the last thing that I need to tell you um, before we go to story time, <laughs> is I was looking up snails and I found this article on the British Library website, uh, one of their blog posts called Night versus Snail. And it's how, oh, I wish I'd been there. What a great bunch of people to live with. A lot of people who work at the British Library went to look at some medieval manuscripts and there was someone there who doesn't study medieval times. They study um, like a little bit later than medieval times. 
And they were amazed to find on these manuscripts that there were loads of paintings of knights, you know, like knights in shining armour, fighting snails. And the medieval experts were really surprised that their colleague was surprised. They're like, yeah, of course, you know, of course, there's loads of knight, there's loads of knight versus snail in medieval manuscripts. I'm just going to assume that they're all out of copyright. Just show you the pictures on their amazing blog, which you should all definitely read. So if you if you put knight versus snail into the Internet, you will get this this blog post. And look, just for, it'll just highlight a few of them. Look, just painting after painting, manuscript after manuscript of knights fighting snails. Why? Well, um, no one really knows. <laughs> Apparently the, the knights quite often lose. Look, wow, that one's really having a terrible time with that snail. So this is a very, very, very common thing. I can't believe I'm only just writing out about it. Knight versus snail, people. Um, they think possibly the snail, because the snail is thought of as a pest, maybe the snail represents the sort of common people rebelling against the, the people in, in power, which is why the knight loses, I don't know. Anyway, brilliant, my day is made. Knight versus snail. Okay, <laughs> it's, time for, it's time for story time. <sighs> knight versus snail, okay. <clears throat> National Trust property of Cliveden in Buckinghamshire. A cafe, a maze, beautiful Italian balconies. It's really got everything you want from a National Trust property. Um, one day in about 2008, a volunteer in Cliveden was cleaning when they spotted a snail that they'd never seen before. <gasps> now, what would you do if you saw a snail you'd never seen before? You'd just go, oh, right, cool. No. So passionate was this National Trust volunteer about the natural world. They thought, A, I've never seen that before. Something must be up. And they contacted snail expert Janet Redou Sharp, who investigated and said, oh my goodness, that is a Papiifera papiaris, which are very common around the Mediterranean, but not native to Britain at all. And there was a population of about 100 of them. Have you, can, you, can you guess why these snails are here? I've given you a clue. I have mentioned it. What, must, what has happened, they think, is that the beautiful balcony at Cliveden was bought in Rome in 1896. And they think that when it was purchased in Rome, there must have been a snail on it, which raised a family, which no one noticed for a hundred years until this volunteer came along. They'd just been living peacefully all that time. And in uh, the over 100 years since they arrived, they have moved 27 metres from, from where they first were. Um, and they are now nicknamed the Cliveden snail. So other snails have come to Britain from uh, a Mediterranean, the, the Mediterranean, the Helix pomenacea. There's far more Helix pomenacea uh, in Britain, but there's, there's still not that many of them. And they're only found in very, very specific areas of South England. Now, this is one of the biggest snails in Europe. It's about 4.5 centimetres. It's now naturalised, meaning it's part of the ecosystem here. My question to you is how does this snail from Europe get to these little pockets of the southern English countryside? How? It didn't crawl off a boat because they only travel about 30 metres their entire life and you do not find them on the coast. Didn't get here by plane, because it's been in Britain for well over 1,000 years and planes weren't invented. What do you think? These little pockets of snails that aren't native to Britain. Uh, I'll give you a clue. The word snail in French is escargot. But escargot has actually kind of become a, a British word as well, an English word meaning uh, any snail that you eat. And helix pomenacea is escargot. It was brought to England by the Romans. 
Romans. The Romans love to eat snails. Poor Romans would just like forage for them in their gardens. And rich Romans would grow them in special containers and then fatten them up with milk and grape juice and flour. Yummy, 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 yum. Um, so in the year 43 onwards, when the Romans in invaded Britain and took up home here, they brought their snails with them. In fact, if you're going to look them up on the internet later, their common name is the Roman snail. Now, Roman snails are listed under the Wildlife and Countryside Act. Here's what I found on the government website. It's illegal to kill them and you can't take them. You're not allowed to pick them up. You need a special license. Even if there's like a Roman snail in the middle of a road, you can't move it. You have to call Natural England. Picking them up to move them counts as taking them because they move so little. I repeat, do not try to take control of a Roman snail, people. You can't pick it up and be like, oh, I was just studying it for educational purposes. No, leave them alone. Um, sadly, they're not doing terribly well, these snails. They live in loose, chalky soil, so they can build their shells out of calcium and bury in its hibernate. But their habitats are under threat. And the BBC News ran a story in 2012 saying that a poacher had actually been caught by volunteers... Uh, with hundreds of the snails in the plastic bags. They think that they were catching them for a restaurant. This whole story time, by the way, is just a celebration of volunteers, I would say. Just give them back our snails. Uh. Um, Phil Palmer of the Congological Society, writing in issue 23 of Mollusk World, a job, I'm assuming, he does not get paid for, um, he says that his friend works with fish fossil, fossil, fish fossils at the Natural History Museum. And his friend said to him one day, sort of joking, your wretched mollusks are eating all the flowers in my garden. So Phil writes on a fantastic uh, blog on the internet, which you should read. Um, well, I denied responsibility and asked for details, particularly the size. So his friend said, well, it showed him with his finger and thumb, look, they've got snails in my garden, they're about four centimetres and they're eating all my stuff. Um, well, Phil asked his friend to send him some shells, which he did. And when the shell arrived in Phil's office, oh, gasp, he couldn't believe it. He fell over backwards. He was so shocked. He said, my days, that is a Roman snail. It's a helix pomatia. He couldn't believe it. His friend lives in Wimbledon in London, not famously very rich in calcium. So he said to his friend, look, can you send me a living one of these things? Uh, and his friend did. Phil says in, this is all coming from the fantastic uh, issue 23 of Mollusk magazine, um, it was a, a splendid beast, convinced I had helix pomination, the Roman snail. I emptied the shells and I exhibited the shells and the specimen at the October 2009 meeting of the Conchological Society. I am glad I did. Three members quietly told me it was not helix pomination at all but Helix Leucorum. That's not listed as being in Britain at all. So that it's a totally new snail to Britain. What has happened? Well, they think maybe someone who had the house before Phil's friend went on holiday and brought a pretty shell home and then realised it had a snail in it, so put it in the garden. But Phil's friend's been there for 14 years, so it's obviously very, the population are very comfortable in his garden in Wimbledon. I don't have his address or we could go and visit the only population of Helix Leucorum in Britain that we know of. Um, but at least after this story time, even if we can't find that place in Wimbledon, you can visit Cliveden, the National Trust property in, uh, in, it's in Berkshire. Hooray for snails and for the volunteers who look after them. The end. I think I might have accidentally said that Cliveton is in Buckinghamshire and Berkshire. Are they two different places? I don't know. It's all down south to me. I'm sure that if you're uh, if you're in the south, then you you know the difference. Uh, right, you lot. <laughs> that is the end of the snail show. Thank you so much for coming. I've learned many wonderful things about snails. This, I've been absolutely delighted by the things that I've found out this show. Um, thank you for coming. If you would like to support me, if you want to keep these going, uh, I do the All Ages Home Ed lesson and I do the an IGCSE physics lesson in the same way. If you want to come watch that, you're most welcome. Everything that I do is free and I am entirely funded 
by uh, people supporting me with five or six pounds a month. Some generous souls are giving more. Five or six pounds is all I need in order to keep going. And if, if you send me five or six pounds a month, I will be so grateful that I will send you nice things. I'll send you rainbow glasses that make you see rainbows. They're so cool. And I'll send you an explanation of how they work. Um, and I'll send you Fate of Science magazine. So Grumpy Husband has gone upstairs to finish off the Sleep magazine, uh, which is the next one. So now is a, I, I'm worried that I always say this, but now is a good time to sign up. Because if you sign up, I will send you um, the a previous magazine, like a past issue, which is on mold, which is really good. But then in a few weeks time, hopefully, you'll receive the Sleep issue through the door, along with all my current supporters. It's got a little free gift in it. If you're allergic to lavender, message me and let me know. Okay, I'm just going onto my Facebook page. Oh, brilliant! Going on my Facebook page. Hey, Ruben's here. Awesome. Ruben's got loads of African land snails. Okay, uh, on my Facebook page, while I'm live on YouTube, I always say, because there's no comments on here, if you want to say hello, then you can. So if you're watching on Catch Up, this might be quite a boring view. Just going to go and see what everyone watching live is saying. Ruben has got loads of giant African snails. How do we see it live? Normally watch after. Oh, you found it! Hooray! <laughs> Glad that had a happy ending. People really struggle finding it on YouTube. Hey, it's Suki and Arthur and Eunice and Salah. You're having science day, just like me. Oh, hello, Grace and Rose. Hey, Thea. Oh, I hope you found it. <coughs> oh, hello, Lucy. Oh, no. You can't find it. Try joining me through Facebook, but only taking us to your front page. Oh, thank you for that. That's useful. Uh, maybe I need to put a different link on my fa on the Facebook advert. Hmm. Hello, Sky and Evie and Honey. You're here again as well. Brilliant. Oh, and Jan found it. Whew. Awesome. <laughs> oh, well done. Right. Okay. Excellent. Oh, so nice to hear from you all. Thank you. Oh, yeah. So were you, were you saying, was this a snail fossil? This is not a snail fossil, um, but it is a mollusk fossil because ammonites are in the same uh, phylum as, I think it's a phylum, as snails. But snails did evolve absolutely ages ago. Yeah, re they're really old. Okay, right, you're not. I'm gonna go. Stop planning for next week. Thank you so much for coming. I'll see you very soon. Bye.